I want to talk about my dream for you because I have been so blessed to live inside the dream of God. I figured out early on, you know, I had these dreams for myself. I used to tell my father, I'm going to live in a house on a hill. I'm going to have a million dollars. And I learned early in my career that the dream I had for myself couldn't compare to the dream that life had for me. So I figured out how to lean in to life, to lean into life and allow the flow that was designed for me to follow, to allow that flow to be my guide. And every decision I've ever made has come from listening to the flow that represents the truth in me that is also the truth in you. You already know the truth. You've been making decisions, having choices fulfilled throughout your life since you were a kid. And being able to make the right choice based upon what is the truth of you is the dream and prayer I hold for you today. Because being able to do that has led me to this stage and many other stages throughout the world. It's the truth. You know, everybody has what I call this instinct, this inner voice. It's called by many names, intuition, the divine, the flow, but everybody has it. And the truth is, Every decision I've ever made that led me to the right space and place in my life, I got there because I relied on that inner voice, the truth of me. When I was 30 years old and about to leave Baltimore, because I felt something inside that thing, that instinct, that flow, that truth that said, it's time to move on. And every single person around me, except for my best friend, Gail, that's why she is my best friend, Gail, said, you shouldn't move to Chicago. You should stay here. My bosses said, you're right here in Baltimore. You're a little fish in a big pond. You can grow old here. I go, that's the problem. I don't want to grow old doing the evening news here. So I listened to that inner voice that said, go. And I knew whether I got the job in Chicago, which of course I did or not, that it was time to leave because the truth of me was urging me forward. And every decision I made after coming to Chicago, when everybody said, you should just take a salary. It's too big of a risk to own yourself, to own your show. What if that show fails? Then you're stuck. I said, I'm gonna bet on myself because the truth of me, the inner voice that I was allowed to get still and feel said, take the risk, bet on yourself. Every decision I've ever made, I've come back to that space and allowed myself to live in the place of intentional living. About 1989, after I'd been doing my show for three years, I ran across a book called The Seed of the Soul by Gary Zukav. And in it, he talked about how every action follows, is followed by a reaction, which we all know is the third law of motion in physics. But he also said that before there's even a thought or an action, there is an intention. Something struck me about that. There's an intention that follow, that it precedes every thought and every action, and the outcome of your experiences is determined by the intention. At the time, I was the kind of woman who tried to do everything that everybody wanted me to do because I just started making money. The amount of money I made was being published. I got a lot of cousins instantly. A lot of people I used to know in school and friends of mine who all needed things. And I had problems saying no. So this principle of intention is what 
literally saved and changed the trajectory of my living because I started to make my decisions based on what I intended, not just what somebody else wanted me to do or what I thought would please them, but what do I really intend to happen from the outcome of this decision or this choice? And so I started to apply this intentional living and this intentional thinking to everything in my life. I said to my producers, do not bring me a show or an idea unless you have a clear intention about why we're doing it, what you want to say, what you want the outcome to be. And changing the paradigm to just from just doing a television show, from just being on TV, to actually intending to be of service to the viewers, change the trajectory of the show. The reason we were number one for 25 solid years is because we intended to be. We intended to create and to use the opportunity of being able to speak to people every day, to use that as a platform to inform their lives in service, intentionally. And I would say to the producers, do not bring me an idea that I cannot find my thread of truth in, so that I could sit in the seat and ask the questions with the intention of accomplishing something bigger than the interview. So I remember the first time I used this principle of intention. There was a mother on who had lost her 16-year-old daughter. She'd been murdered by her boyfriend. Junior in high school, popular, straight A's, cheerleader. Everybody loved her. Nobody ever suspected that the boyfriend was abusing her. I learned then, back in the 90s, that domestic violence for young girls, for teenagers, is at the same rate of domestic violence for grown women in this country. One out of four girls, 14 to 18, dating, are being abused by their boyfriends. So this girl had hidden it from her mother and her friends because girls hide it because they don't want anybody to know, and also because they want to keep the boyfriend. So I went into the green room and I asked the mother, please tell me why you're here. What is your intention? She said, I'm here because your producers asked me to come. I said, but what is the reason you said yes? What is your true intention in being here? And she said, I want people to know that my daughter's life was bigger than her death. Everywhere I go, people only want to talk about her death and how she died and how I didn't know or why I should have known. But I want people to know that my daughter, our daughter was loved. She was loved by her siblings and loved by her friends and she loved us and she had a life that was bigger than her murder. And I said, good, I can do that. I can make sure that people know that your daughter's life meant something, that her being here on the planet Earth for 16 years truly mattered. And here's my intention. I want everybody who hears your daughter's story to be able to see their friend, to see themselves, and to know that to remain silent can be a killer. And so every question that I ask you comes from the point of view of an intention to serve the life of your daughter so that her life would not have been in vain. That's the first show I won an Emmy for, when I aligned the intentions. And since that time, <laughs> since that time, I don't make a decision without getting still, checking in with my inner truth, with what is the real reason I'm doing anything. Fail big. That's right. Fail big. 
Today is the beginning of the rest of your life, and it can be it can be very frightening. It's a new world out there. It's a mean world out there, and you only live once. So do what you feel passionate about. Passionate about. Take chances professionally. Don't be afraid to fail. There's an old IQ test was nine dots, and you had to draw five lines with a pencil within these nine dots without lifting the pencil. The only way to do it was to go outside the box. So don't be afraid to go outside the box. Don't be afraid to think outside the box. Don't be afraid to fail big, to dream big. But remember, dreams without goals are just dreams, and they ultimately fuel disappointment. So have dreams, but have goals, life goals, yearly goals, monthly goals, daily goals. I try to give myself a goal every day. Sometimes it's just to not curse somebody out. <laughs> Simple goals, but have goals, and understand that to achieve these goals, you must apply discipline and consistency. In order to achieve your goals, you must apply discipline, which you have already done, and consistency every day, not just on Tuesday and miss a few days. You have to work at it every day. You have to plan every day. You've heard the saying: "We don't plan to fail; we fail to plan." Hard work works. Working really hard is what successful people do. And in this text, tweet, twerk world that you've grown up in, <laughs> remember: just because you're doing a lot more, doesn't mean you're getting a lot more done. Remember that: just because you're doing a lot more, doesn't mean you're getting a lot more done. Don't confuse movement with progress. My mother told me, she said, "Yeah, because you can run in place all the time and never get anywhere. So continue to strive, continue to have goals, continue to progress. You'll never see a U-Haul behind a hearse. I'll say it again. You'll never see a U-Haul behind a hearse. I don't care how much money you make, you can't take it with you. The Egyptians tried it. They got robbed." That's all they got. You can't take it with you, with you, and it's not how much you have. It's what you do with what you have. We all have different talents. Some of you will be doctors, some lawyers, some scientists, some educators, some nurses. The most selfish thing you can do in this world is help someone else. Why is it selfish? Because. The gratification, the goodness that comes to you, the good feeling, the good feeling that I get from helping others, nothing's better than that. Well, one or two things, but nothing's better than that. Not, not jewelry, not big house I have, not the cars, but the, the, it's the joy. That's where the joy is in helping others. That's where the success is in helping others. Finally, I pray that you put your slippers. Way under the bed tonight, so that when you wake up in the morning, you have to get on your knees to reach them. And while you, when while you're down there, say thank you for grace, thank you for mercy, thank you for understanding, thank you for wisdom, thank you for parents, thank you for love, thank you for kindness, thank you for humility. Thank you for peace. Thank you for prosperity. Say thank you in advance for what's already yours. That's how I live my life. That's where I, why I am. One of the reasons why I am today. Say thank you in advance for what is already yours. True desire in the heart for anything good is God's proof to you, sent beforehand to indicate. That it's yours already.
I'll say it again. True desire in the heart, that itch that you have, whatever it is you want to do, that thing that you want to do to help others and to, to grow and to make money, that desire, that itch, that's God's proof to you, sent beforehand already to indicate that it's yours. And anything you want good, you can have. So claim it. Work hard to get it. When you get it, reach back. Pull someone else up. Each one, teach one. Don't just aspire to make a living. Aspire to make a difference. How did you turn your pain into purpose? Well, before the pain became a purpose, it was just an acknowledgement of what had happened to me. And one of the things we talk about in the What Happened to You book is that anything that has happened to you, and I wanted to just make this point to everybody, there's not a black woman in this room who hasn't been through something that helped her build strength, and then something else that helped you build strength, and then something else that helped you build strength. I mean. Sometimes you go through so much, you say, God, don't teach me nothing else new today. I don't need no more strength building. But, but this is what I know, is that strength times strength times strength times strength. Every time you got stronger, you were building power. Because strength times strength times strength times strength equals powerful. So we're sitting in a room amongst ourselves with all of these powerful women who have their stories of what happened to you that you can now turn into post-traumatic wisdom. So what I was able to do was to take what had happened to me and to use it as an empathy builder for myself and for other people. And it is my empathy and connection that has allowed me to be the woman that I am today. And so anything that has happened to you, if you are willing to learn from it, to open up and no longer allow the stigma and shame to cause you to hide your secrets, but to know that your vulnerability is where your real strength lies and take that pain and turn it into something meaningful for yourself. And as Maya used to say, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now, not even the sexual abuse, the sexual assault. You know, when I was raped, I didn't even know, I didn't even know what a penis was. And like so many other people in this room who were also sexually assaulted when they were young, I didn't tell anybody because I knew it would be turned on me. I knew I was not in a safe environment where other adults would trust my word. And so I kept it to myself until I was on, literally on an Oprah Winfrey show. Somebody shared their story of abuse and I was like, I thought I was the only one. I thought I was the only person who had been raped at nine and molested until till I was 14. So I think being able to take your pain and turn it into purpose and power begins first with being able to empathize with other people who've been through the same kind of pain. And everything that's happened to you has also happened for you, if you allow it to be. There's not one thing that has happened to you that you cannot now turn into something that is useful and meaningful in the life that you are now leading forward. God shows us how to do this in the book of Genesis. The Bible says that God stepped out on nothing and said, let there be something and let there be light. And there was light and, and the evening and the morning was the first day. And guess what? No angels, no choir, no spouse, no friends, no person came along. Nobody started dancing. No praise team came along and said, so God clapped for himself. He said, and it was good. And it was good. It doesn't have to be finished to be good. Some of you wait too late to clap. You're not gonna clap till it's finished, but you gotta clap behind every accomplishment and celebrate every step. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in the way. And every time you take a stop, you need to clap for that step because at least I'm further than where I was. I may not be where I'm going, but I'm further than where I was. Am I talking to anybody this morning? 
And so you need to praise God for baby steps. Praise God for progress. Praise God for improvement. Celebrate within yourself and not be afraid to look yourself in the mirror and say, you did that well. You did that real well. You'll never be able to determine who you need in your life until you fill your own void. You'll choose somebody out of your pain and then when you get well, you don't want them. On the other extreme, but equally as dangerous, but the antithesis of inferiority is the assumption that what God has given to you requires nothing of you. You don't put anything into it. You just received it, you got it, you think it ought to be there. Anything you add to your life requires your attention. If you have a goldfish, you have to feed it. If you get a cute little puppy, you got to walk it. If you buy a car, you're going to need oil. If you buy a car, you're going to need gas. Anything you add to your life is going to require more of you. Stop adding more than you're willing to maintain. Say this word with me. No. Some of you have said yes so much because you assume that you are collecting whatnots to keep on a shelf, but in reality, you keep saying yes and not really taking care of what you already got. You keep adding more and more and more and more to your life. And then somewhere on some therapist's couch, you say, I'm overwhelmed and I'm nervous and I got anxiety. And I guess you do. To him whom much is given, much is required. This grandiose mentality that you have has led you to a place of utter frustration. You underestimate what greatness costs. This is a dangerous thing. You don't seek to keep up, advance your skills, study or work out. You don't seek to maintain the relationship, keep it spicy and interesting. You think I got that on lock. You do not have that on lock. You have, come on, come on, come on. You never, you never have it on lock. You don't have your husband on lock. You don't have your wife on lock. You don't have your career on lock. You don't have your child on lock. You don't have your mama on lock. You don't ever have anything on lock. That's why you gotta celebrate people while you have them. You have to love them while you got them. You gotta pour into them while they're there. You don't have it on lock. Somebody is after your job right now. Somebody's after your spouse right now. Somebody's after your house right now. Somebody's after your position right now. Never fall into complacency and think that you are so wonderful that your just being there is all that's required. No, 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 no. Complacency will not do it. You have got to put some grind in it, some sweat into it, some work into it. That's why you don't need too many it's. Because every it you take on is going to take something from you. It's going to give something to you, but it's going to take something from you. And there may not be enough of you to handle all the places you said yes to. And you've got to be able to evaluate. Am I a pint, am I a pint size container with a gallon size appetite? Now I live in a house that my father would have bragged about cleaning. And my childhood imaginations were, what would the art look like in that house if somebody like me owned it? What, what, what would the, the, the core of the house look like if somebody like me owned it? And you'll be happy to know that half of my house is filled up with art from Kenya. I have every piece of art that you have ever given me or that I have ever bought or that I have ever had access to online to those few businesses who advertise online. Listen up. There is huge demand for what you have around the world. Get out of the box. Get out of your shell. Don't devalue because what you call normal, we call amazing. I get more hits when I post music from the services than I do over here. When I put them on social media, I get more hits from America than I do when we play our own music. 
The problem with greatness, when you have greatness, greatness to you might escape your mind because your greatness is also in your normal. Things that you step over, things that you overlook, things that you take for granted, things that might not be valuable to you because you are inundated and saturated with them are valuable to other people around the world. I was just talking to a gentleman the other day who said he exports artwork from this country and then resells it in other countries at three times and four times the price that you pay, for, that you sell it for retail over here. We all have to think differently. There's a book out that I highly remind, uh, uh, want to recommend that you read. The book is called The World is Flat. Technology has flattened the world. There are no barriers. There are no restrictions. There are no limitations. You can go as far as you want to go if you know how to work it right. You got to start thinking differently. Your marketplace may not just be your neighborhood. It may be your world. I had the reason I'm standing on this stage today is because our world is much smaller. We are interconnected. We are interdependent. And that's why we need each other in order to succeed. I wrote the book of which this conference is titled after and the book is called Soar. And the book is based on the idea that the Wright brothers stood on the ground looked up in the air and had a ridiculous thought. They said, we should fly. Can you imagine selling that idea at that time? It was ludicrous. And besides, they had no degree in engineering. They had no background in engineering. They had no previous experience in building anything like an airplane. They were bicyclists. They built bicycles. And the first airplane was built in a bicycle shop. You cannot use what you do not have to limit where you are trying to go. You have to take what you've got and take it and use it until you get what you want. The very first airplane was made not in an airplane hangar, not with the proper tools, not with the proper education. They lacked the resources. They had to fight for money. They succeeded where others had failed, and then they finally got the plane built. And when they built the plane and they all got it ready to fly, they had to move it all the way from, I believe it was Dayton, Ohio, to North Carolina, to a place called Kitty Hawk. And they moved it all the way down there before they tried to fly it, because they understood that in order for the plane to fly, it had to be in the right wind. They moved it because the wind was right. I came all the way from Dallas, Texas to tell you in Kenya, the wind is right for your dream. The wind is right. What does that mean? It means that in order to be successful, you have to do the right thing at the right time in the right atmosphere. And that's why there has to be a collaborative effort to get the right atmosphere for you to be successful. Praying about it is good. Talking about it is good. Having a business plan is critical. But there has to be more than that. There has to be a conscious effort by all the elected officials to work diligently to bring opportunities into this country that create a win for you to succeed and to be successful so that the education that you have and the opportunities that you seek will be supplemented by the right atmosphere that makes it conducive for you to go after what you're trying to accomplish. More than ever, I would have to say, I miss the Oprah Winfrey show. I chose to let it go. I felt that I'd said everything I needed to say after 25 years, and I wanted it to be my decision when I let it go. But I will say this past year, and now more than ever, I miss it because I miss the opportunity for the spirit of constructive engagement that that platform offered. So two weeks after the election last year, I went to a diner in Queens for Oprah Magazine with a group of women. 
Half of them were Trump supporters. Half of them were Hillary supporters. Nobody wanted to come to breakfast. I was like, it's gonna be some great, great, great <laughs> croissants. We're gonna have some nice jams, ladies. Nobody wanted to sit down and have the croissants. So everybody came in the room all tight and hardened. And so we were able to, I was able to, they were like, well, I, I've never been this close to these uh, Hillary elitists. I've never been this close. And there are other people were saying, well, I never sat this close to Trump supporter before, but we're going to do it. I will tell you, after two and a half hours, I had those women not only eating croissants, sitting around the table, listening to each other's stories, hearing both sides, and by the end, they were holding hands, exchanging emails and phone numbers and singing Reach Out and Touch. We're all pretending to be Diana Ross, which means it's possible, it can happen. So I want you to work in your own way to change the world in respectful conversations with others at a rate and a rhythm that's in tune with the source from which you have come, your truth. And I want you to enter every situation aware of its context, open to hear the truths of others, and most important, open to letting the process of changing the world change you. That is the spirit of constructive engagement. So that's the goal, to be a compassionate woman of substance, to be committed, to have constructive engagement, to live this life of substance, substance. What I know for sure is if you focus on the substance, the success will come.